Um, I'm Eric Evans. Uh, I work at Rackspace in the US, in Texas specifically. Uh, and I'm a committer on the Apache Cassandra project. And uh, that's basically what I do at Rackspace. I work on Cassandra. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the way I'm hoping to break this down is a little bit of background. Hopefully, that's not a too well worn of a path at this point. I know I'm overlapping on some. A um, little high level description. I kind of want to hit like the high points, things I think that you know I could hit in a reasonable period of time that might convince somebody who's looking for a data store that Cassandra's the right choice. Um, and then I'll probably just rip through the API stuff real quick because. Uh, um, it's really easy to figure out on your own anyway, and spend some time on some code examples. Okay, so uh, last five years, there's been a couple of very influential white papers. Um, most everyone here has probably read them or at least heard of them. You have uh, the big table paper from Google and the Dynamo paper from Amazon. And while they took two very different approaches, um, there's a lot of overlap in their requirements. They're both interested in scaling to very large data sets, very high throughput. Um, Dynamo also had the constraint of, of high availability, so that's probably what influenced their decision to go with the eventual consistency model. Um, Big Table is strong consistency, uh, but they also have a much richer data set or data model. They have sort of a uh, sparse table type data model. Um, anybody who sat through the Hypertable talk earlier today, this is all you know, identical from, from that presentation. Um, and so how does that fit in the whole NoSQL space? Um, this still confuses everybody. It's probably an indicator that we need to just stop using that name. Um, so what I usually do is just disregard all of those projects, out of no offense to the people who, who, who are supporting them, uh, disregard them for purposes of a discussion like this, cross off all of the ones that, that are not about scaling to very large data sets, very high throughput on commodity hardware. I mean, some of those may scale for some definition of scale, may scale really well, but their primary goal is something else, like an alternate data model. So then if you, if you remove those, and this list isn't comprehensive, it's supposed to be representative, um, you can order them pretty neatly by, you know, whether they were influenced by Bigtable or whether they were influenced by Dynamo. Cassandra's kind of, you know, not so easy to classify like that, and that's because it's kind of like, <laughs> hybrid. Now, this is proof that I should not use GIMP. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, uh, so, so Cassandra has the data model. It, share, it shares a lot of the big table architecture. It's got the, the same, pretty much the same data model. Um, it uses the same log structured merge tree uh, for, for storage, but it has the distribution and the eventual consistency of Dynamo. So we like to kind of tongue in cheek refer to it as a uh, next generation, you know, best of breed kind of, you know, it's, it's buzzwords, right? We're supposed to. Um, another popular way of classifying it is to whip out the venerable cap theorem and say, you know, pick two. And then you can just easily say, well, you know, HBase is CP and Voltamort is, is AP. Um, I don't like that definition. <clears throat> um, it's kind of like we're treating the cap theorem like a board game with a colored wheel that we take turns spinning. It's not, it, that's, that's not really what it says. The cap theorem is just a tool uh, for anybody who hasn't heard the cap theorem pitch. It's consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Um, the pick two is the part I have a problem with because it's, it's not really that simple. Um, the cap theorem is just a tool that we use to describe the conflicting properties in a distributed storage system. Um, and in an eventual, especially in light of the dynamo-like eventual consistency systems, it's not, you're not giving up consistency, you're not throwing it away, it's not inconsistent. Um, it's best to treat it like it's like a giant knob and you, know, there you have an inverse effect on availability. So um, you can dial consistency down to bring availability up or vice versa. Okay, so some of the high points, or at least some I thought I'd pick out for the, this presentation. Um, a Cassandra system is symmetric. By that I mean all of the nodes are exactly identical. There's no single point of failure. There's no bottleneck. There's, uh, you know, there's only one function within a Cassandra cluster, and that's the node. Um, and that's really nice because, I mean, as a result, it's linearly scalable. 
assuming all of your machines are the same, a cluster with 10 nodes has twice the capacity of one with five, and one with 20 has twice again. Um, it, it also makes things very easy to debug and administer um, because there's just less variables in play. Um, another interesting property is that placement of data within the cluster is pretty flexible. And so um, you can adapt it to your app, you know, patterns in your application or uh, to use it to build fault tolerance, or, uh, geographic isolation, things like that. I'll get into more of that. Uh, provisioning is automa automated, so in addition to being able to just scale out linearly, you can actually do that easily, too. And because of its eventually consistent nature, it's high availabil highly available. So to drill into some of these, um, this has probably been wore out by now, too. But uh, Cassandra uses uh, content addressing. I won't say consistent hashing because it's not limited to just consistent hashing. And the way, uh, the way content addressing works is if you imagine, uh, well, all records are stored according to a key. Um, and the key determines its placement within the, within the cluster, within the, within the ring. So if you imagine uh, coming up with a namespace that inc was inclusive of all of your keys and then assigning IDs to the nodes, uh, to create a good distribution around that namespace and then order them like highest to lowest to create a ring like this, then you just need to find out where the key goes and you take the next one working clockwise. That's, that's your destination. Then replica placement just needs to be something that's deterministic on that location. So you know, in this drawing, it's the next n minus one nodes around the ring. So partitioning can be done a couple of different ways, you know, batteries included anyway. Um, you can use a random partitioner, which is uh, uh, consistent hashing, creates a 128-bit namespace for you that corresponds to the size of an MD5 hash. Um, so you can imagine there, we're taking something you know unique to the node, hashing it to create a nice distribution of the nodes around the ring. And when you store a, a, a key, when you store a, a record, um, the key is hashed in order to find that location. So you can imagine that that produces very good distribution. But obviously, the, the order that they're sorted around the ring is by the hash, and, and that kind of destroys the context. So if you need to be able to do range queries, um, we have this order preserving partitioner. Um, and basically, you define the namespace. You define the, the key distribution and, and assign the tokens. That can be actively load balanced later on, but you know, we encourage you to, to think about that so you're not moving too much data around. Um, and then you can do range and cover queries, you can enumerate in sorted order, um, which is pretty important for some applications. And uh, this is pluggable, so you could write your own partitioning scheme if that made sense for you. So placement of the additional copies is also uh, pluggable. The, uh, we, we do this with what's called an endpoint snitch. The default is, uh, works just like I described before. It takes the next n minus one successive nodes around the ring, places the copies there. But uh, we have this rack inferring snitch, which you can use uh, to adopt a convention to, in assigning the IP addresses, and it will infer you know, both rack locations within a data center or entire data center locations and spread the copies out across those. Or you can use a property file snitch, which is another example. You just specify, specify them as key value pairs in a, a Java property file. Um, I know of one Cassandra user who I don't know sure if it's been open source, but they wrote an endpoint snitch for using uh, on Amazon EC2 so that they could distribute the replicas across regions. So that's an example of something you could do with this pluggable endpoint snitches. Uh, when you start up a new node to provision extra capacity, the joining node will look at all the existing nodes. <coughs> It'll find the most heavily loaded node uh, storage-wise. It'll pick a location that's halfway in that, in that range. Copy, all over, copy over all the corresponding keys for that, that midpoint, and then join the ring and start answering requests. That's what happens on the back end. That's completely automated, though, is you just stand up a new node, and you point it at at least one of the existing nodes, and it just does it. And then again, the feature that provides such high availability uh, is eventual consistency. And the way that works is you're given consistency levels to choose from on both reads and writes. Uh, the client determines this. There's five different choices that we have, only three of which apply to read. But all, they, all of them boil down to is how many copies you're going to block on before you consider that a successful operation. Um, 
And the, the rule of thumb here is that so long as the number you're blocking on for a write and a read, the sum of those is greater than the total number of replicas, you have consistency. So it's probably better with an explanation. If we had a replica count of three, um, and we decided to use the quorum consistency, which is one more than half, um, then the number that we're blocking on is two. And so uh, you know, we make these two writes. Let's say they go to these two lower nodes um, and return successful. That other node, the, the third node, the top one, we have no guarantees on that. It doesn't mean it's out of date. It doesn't mean it's inconsistent. In fact, if everything's working properly, it is consistent probably within milliseconds. But if you followed it up with a read fast enough or if there was a partition or some sort of problem, then you know, that's, that's what we mean by there's no guarantees. Um, but if you did a, cons uh, a quorum read, um, r equals 2, w equals 2, 4 is greater than 3, you're always guaranteed to overlap and hit one of these fresher, more up-to-date values. And so in the worst case, you hit you know, one new one and one old one, and Cassandra will just simply return to you the, the, the current value and repair that um, out-of-date one. So that's, that's kind of, you know, I blew, blew through it kind of fast, but I mean, that's really all it boils down to. If you want strong consistency, you could have it. In fact, the uh, consistency level all is going to make sure that all copies are up to date um, when an operation completes. And I mean, that's, that's as strong consistency as you're going to get on any system. But the value here is that that third node could be down. I mean, you could, you know, it could be failed, and, and your, both your reads and your writes will succeed. So you've bought a lot of fault tolerance there. So modeling data in Cassandra um, basically works like this. You, you know, the uppermost namespace is a, is a key space. That's just more or less like a multi-tenancy feature. Uh, I basically see one of those per application, so you can kind of look past that for now. Um, key spaces can have an arbitrary number of column families. Column families are where the records are stored, and records are simply just you know, a key and a collection of columns. Um, but it's at that record level that you get atomicity, and the column families are where the indexing occurs. So you know, this is where you would store uh, similar similar records, the sort of things that you would want to query back at, at once. So it's, it's like big table, like hypertable, like HBase. It's, it's a sparse table, basically. It's a table where the number and disposition of the columns, are the, you know, there's no constraints on that. Drilling into the column a little bit more, or yeah, the column. Uh, there's three attributes. This timestamp is just by convention milliseconds since the epoch, and so you can kind of ignore that. And I mean, it's not it's not part of your data, so to speak. It just determines you know last right wins, uh, and then you have a name and a value, both of which are binary. The value is opaque to Cassandra, but the name is kind of important because it's expected that it'll encode to a, a, a specific type, and that you'll be able to use that uh, when constructing predicates, um, and it'll also be used to determine the sort order. So the way that works is when you define a column family, you, one of the attributes you define is this comparator. Um, so by way of example, if you wanted your columns to be uh, numeric and you wanted them to be sorted numerically and you wanted to be able to do predicates, you know, of say, you know, give me all the columns that are greater than 100 and less than 10,000, uh, you could choose the long type comparator. Um, and then you just, as long as you construct column names that are, uh, you know, network order, network byte order longs, um, then, then it'll, it'll sort them numerically and allow you to do those uh, predicates. This composite type, um, these comparators are also pluggable. This composite type is an example of a comparator that somebody wrote. Um, and it's kind of neat because, you know, there's a link here at the bottom. If you're interested, I encourage you to check it out. It actually creates composite types by you know, combining these other types, an arbitrary number of them. Um, and what you, it essentially allows you to do is turn that flat namespace, that series of columns, into you know, a, uh, a multi-dimensional data structure of arbitrary depth. It's kind of neat. Neat hack. OK, so uh, Cassandra's API is implemented in Thrift. Uh, Thrift is another Apache project in the incubator. Um, it's a compact uh, binary RPC framework. Um, the cool thing about Thrift is it supports a lot of different languages, a lot of different language environments. Um, I, I think that's the only thing that's cool about Thrift. I'm really trying hard, but 
I think that's pretty much it. Um, we tend, tend to, you know, more and more these days, we tend to push people towards the, uh, you know, the higher level idiomatic client libraries that, you know, abstract all the, the boilerplate away. Um, there's a couple of really good ones emerging. Hector for Java and Picasa for Python are both shaping up pretty nicely. Uh, there's a link down here at the bottom of the slide that has the most comprehensive list I know of. Um, just a quick look at some of the read methods so you can get an idea of what the query API looks like. Um, you can do a get, which given a key and a column family and the column name would return a column. Uh, a, a get slice would, would you know, take similar parameters, only you'd use a, a predicate instead of the column name, you know, maybe specify a range, um, a range of columns, and that would return a list of columns. You can do that for a set of keys. You can retrieve the count, the number of columns in a row, or you can do that for a set of records. And then this get range slices, if you're using the ordered partitioner, you could say, you know, for key starting at foo and ending at bar and for all columns between, you know, X and Y and just return them all in one shot. Uh, the right methods are about what you would expect. You can do an insert of a single column. You can insert multiple columns at once. You can remove a column. And then this batch mutate in the, in the next version of Cassandra will actually deprecate batch insert because it, it does what batch insert does, but also allows you to delete like all in one shot. Okay, so I'll run through some examples. Uh, and I'm gonna use Picasa, the py uh, Python client library. And uh, kind of goes beyond the scope of this presentation to, to go into you know, too much depth with Picasa, but as uh, in a nutshell, you call one of the connect functions to return a thrift proxy client. You can use that to call you know, any of the raw thrift methods directly. Um, and you, or you could take that and you can pass it into the you know, constructor of a column family instance along with the key space and column name. And then Picasa has its own API methods that are, that are a little higher level, a little easier to use, a little more Pythonic um, than thrifts would be. So if we walk through an example, like a, this is be a really dumb example for Cassandra. I would encourage anybody to go out and implement an address book in Cassandra, but um, I think it's something everybody could conceptualize. So um, in the current stable version of Cassandra, column families are, are defined in, the, in the, the, uh, the main configuration file. Um, that's changing for the next version. It's already, it's already in trunk. It's already shaping up really nicely, and you'll be able to do that with API calls to you know, dynamically create key spaces and column families. But right now, you'd have to do that in the config file. And this is what it would look like. You specify a comparator. Um, the bytes type comparator is the default. And for all intents and purposes, it's probably effectively no sorting order. Um, there are a lot of different options you can pass in creating a column family. Uh, rows cache would, is literally like you know, going to store the full, full records in like a, an LRU basis. So you could use that as a substitute for memcache. Keys cached will just cache key locations. So depending on what your query load looks like, um, you know, obviously caching key locations is a, requires a lot less memory, and so you know, you could make a better go of it for certain patterns one way or the other. Um, and then so adding some columns would be a simple matter of you know, passing into the, you know, assuming this address is here is a is an already set up column family instance because of column family instance, we can call the insert method with a key, and then a dictionary that, that represents the columns. So in this case, you know, the, the columns are a Python dictionary where the key value pairs equate to the names and values in, in Cassandra's columns. And Picasa is handling the, uh, the timestamp for us. So fetching it would mean calling Picasa's get method, uh, passing in the key, and it's going to give us back a dictionary that specifies the columns. Again, where the, the keys and Python keys and values are, represent the names and values of the, of the columns in Cassandra. Um, like Doug mentioned in the hypertable talk earlier, uh, we don't currently have any support, like native support for secondary indexes. That, that's coming either in the next version or the one after, so let's say anywhere in the like, two to six month timeline. Um, but right now we just recommend that if you have that need that you, you roll your own in, in your application using another column family. 
So if you were to take that, that address book and you wanted to index it on city, you can create another column family called by city. And then when you insert the record, you'd also just insert a, insert a record that would you know, map this, the, the city to the key so that you could essentially pull, pull a slice of all of the columns um, in Austin, for example, to retrieve all of the, the, um, all of the IDs, all of the keys in uh, the addresses column family. Uh, something probably a little bit more practical would be the storage of time series data. Um, so this is a pretty common pattern. I mean, anybody who's ever used like an RAD graph, this is that's what you're doing there. You know, you're storing some some piece of data, uh, you know, on a set, set time interval, and you know you're you're using it to trend, uh, report that sort of thing. So if you were to do that with Cassandra, uh, you know, you can create a column family for it. Uh, set the comparator to long type. And then if you look at the, the insert down here, we're going to use that, that long as, as a uh, column name, and then the value would be whatever it was that we had, that we had collected, you know, uh, in, an, in or out octets on an interface or hits from a web, uh, web access log or something. Um, this upper statement is, is basically how you'd have to create that, uh, that timestamp because it's expected to be in binary format, you know, at, and along, you've got uh, a call to time to create, to, get, to obtain the current time in seconds, and then we're going to, you know, expand that to the milliseconds resolution, cast it to a long, and then pack, it turns it into a binary string. That's a little kludgy, but uh, I, it's, it was the best thing we could think of when I happened to support, you know, a, a lot of different uh, client languages. Um, so if you were to, to slice uh, or perform a query, uh, you could likewise create another uh, column name that represented the start time and pass that in as column start, and column end will automatically be assumed to be the, the, you know, the last record. Um, or if you wanted to specify an end time, you could create another timestamp and pass that as, the col as a column finish keyword. Um, and this bottom invocation also pulls all of the records from one to the next. So from keys starting at org.apache to, you know, keys ending in org.debian, uh, pull this 24-hour slice of, of columns out. And that's what I have. I have. Your questions? So the question is, what, what are we using Cassandra for at Rackspace? There's a lot of things. Most of the ones I'm allowed to talk about still, allowed to talk about, are kind of boring. So they're, they're these kind of stats type of things, you know, where we're collecting massive amounts of customer data and usage data, that sort of thing, and, uh, and, and using Cassandra to store it and p reporting on it. Um, there's lots of other projects in the works. There's one, one that... Uh, I'm not sure at what stage they're at, if they're just researching or whatever, but I mean, there's some serious talk of using it as a mail store and where actual emails are stored directly in Cassandra. I think that would be pretty cool. I'm not sure what status is of that, though. Yeah. So the question is, I didn't mention super columns. Will they go away? I did not mention super columns on purpose because they tend to just confuse everybody and they're the exception to every rule. I mean, they're kind of powerful, and I figure anybody who wants to get into Cassandra will find out about them soon enough. And and uh, we've got twenty more minutes. Twenty more minutes. Yeah. Well, I was expecting it to run long, and I didn't run that short. Like so, so super columns are in, instead of ha instead of a record consisting of a key and a collection of columns, the super columns are are a key and a collection of super columns, each of which can store an arbitrary number of subcolumns, and subcolumns are just like the columns I explained where you have a name and a value and a timestamp. So it's, it's like creating, you know, like a, another la you know, layer to the data structure, another level. Um, I specifically omitted it because that's the part where everyone starts to get really confused and, you know, they, you know especially, I'm not sure the terminology is as good as it could be. And, uh, I, I, you know, I started throwing out this composite type because basically it kind of does the same thing, only, only 
and, you know, an arbor, you know, creates a da data structure of an arbitrary, arbitrary de depth, so it's even better. And yes, there is some talk about simply just removing super columns because they're, they're, they're more, they're seeming to be, seem like they're more of a liability to explain and get people up to speed than they are an asset. Most people uh, who need that are avoiding them anyway and using some sort of compound column. It will go this way. <laughs> So that sounds like the standard streaming question or whatever. Can you can you retrieve a range of a value? No. Um, values could be. I mean, the limitation is basically you know is going to be like your available memory mostly. Um, so I mean, there's a practical limit on you know a few megs, t a few tens of megs is probably fine. You know, maybe even bigger if you know you can buffer all that in memory. But um, it's it's designed more for you know structured data for for small pieces of data. So. It's probably not the best. And where was it? Right there. So the question was, can we do MapReduce? And the answer is yes, we can do MapReduce. We have Hadoop support. MapReduce is done with Hadoop. Yes? OK. So uh, like I said, we had that. Uh, how far back am I have to go? So, you probably the simplest is is the placement of the re of the of the replicas with the with the snitch. So, um, I think this rack inferring snitch is probably just IPv4 only. And I believe the way it works is is it infers data centers from the second octet of the IP, and then rack location with the third octet of the IP. Um, so you know you can use you can use those to make sure that your your copies are distributed out across like you know pieces infrastructure pieces within a data center you know like so they're on different power supplies or racks or whatever um, and so that they're also likewise distributed out across data centers and all that's really doing is 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 it's basically implementing a comparator so it's changing the sort order um, so you know you you also get like locality that way. Um, there's, I think it's, I think it'll be complete in the next version. There's also a DC quorum support going in. It's it's kind of in 06, but I don't think it works. But it will in the next one. And so what what that'll allow you to do is to specify like a quorum or consistency level that that accounts for the data center location for the locality, so that you could say, I want to block on two. You know, I have four replicas, and I want to block on say three copies. And I want them to be the three, you know, in in this data center across these two racks or something like that. Yes. The largest production instance, I still I think that's still Facebook. They have a, uh, they have uh, last I heard was uh, uh, like a hundred and some nodes and one hundred and seventy terabytes of data. Not that I'm aware of. I'm sorry, what was the question again? Uh, Jan talked about uh, uh, possibilities to, to listen to changes, so to connect this report or to a node, and to listen to all the changes that go through that node. Oh. So messaging upwards and stuff like that. To receive a, receive a stream of events, all the changes? Yeah, we don't have anything like that. Yes. Yes. That's that's typically what people do. In fact, they'll even, you know, forego any you know any other separate caching layer, you know, provided you can you can give it enough memory, um, and allow Cassandra to cache the cache the results. Um, Dig uses it this way. Twitter uses it. I'm not sure what stage Twitter is at with their deployment. Um, they're doing something with it, and they're planning on doing more. But I just don't know where the where the line is. Dig is is their their next version that's coming out um, is completely on on Cassandra and yeah they're serving directly out of doing live queries directly out of it. Yeah, 
Okay, so the, uh, the question was, I put up a really creepy picture and said that there was, you know, that it was a hybrid of both. Or, um, and is there any killer feature that each one of the, the either or, either or uh, the Dynamo or Big Table clones don't have? And so I'd say, yeah, I mean, I th we look at it as a superset of either. So um, compared to Dynamo, the, you know, Dynamo or Voldemort or, you know, one of, the, one of the clones, it has a much richer data model than those do. Um, and it has the uh, it has the really f really high right throughput the right throughput that you get with that log structured merge tree, um, but uh, you know compared to the big table clones, it's got the you know I, I consider the eventual consistency a feature, so I have the ability to to like control you know to trade off consistency for availability that I would never get in a big table system. I also have a lot more you know like that simplicity, so all of the nodes being the same and, and true linear linear scalability. So that you know, adding another node adds another node's worth of capacity, as opposed to you know that being there being a you know diminishing return there. Yes. Yes. Right. Right now, it's it uses a timestamp. Last right wins, and that's I'm sorry. Right. So the question was, is it uh, timestamp is used to to do last right last right wins? Is that correct? Rack, rack conflict resolution, right? And so that's a little bit brittle. I mean, if 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 your clocks are skewed on the on the client machines, then you could get unexpected behavior there. For the most part, in practice, it seems to work really well for people. Um, that was actually you know, the the original engineer of, of uh, Cassandra at Facebook, Avinash Lakshmi. He worked at uh, Amazon as a one of the engineers on on Dynamo. So he knows all about vector clocks or whatever, and it was a conscious effort to leave that out and to use timestamps because you know, he felt that was good enough, that that was, that, that was effectively how most people use them anyway. Um, I'd have to agree at this point because despite, you know, a lot of people are like, ooh, you know, it doesn't really seem to cause anybody any real issues. Um, the one thing that has come up that you just can't do with, with, that, with, with a timestamp is uh, you know, auto-incrementing or decrementing a value. That's just some. That's that's something. There's no easy way to do. I mean, you could. We have people who are doing that, like setting that, rolling that their own with like Zookeeper. You know, setting up Zookeeper for the coordination. Um, but then you know that's not. You know, you have this really you know di fully distributed system. You don't want to like taint it that way. Um, so Dig uh, kind of felt that pain as well, and they've 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 implemented vector clocks. If that doesn't go in in the next version, which I'm pretty sure it will, if that'll make it for the next re release, then it'll definitely be for the, the following one. So again, two to, say, six months timeline. No. I'll say, so if you've... Uh, oh, actually, yes, the answer is quite. So, so let, me get, let, me, let me make sure I got the question. I, I, I was bouncing the question in my head when I should have been repeating it. So the answer was, if, you do, if you're blocking for two and it only succeeds on one and then the, the second one fails and, the, and the, hence the right fails, is that, uh, is that a value? Uh, is, that, is, is that copy still on the other node? And, and, and no, the answer is no. It's not. The Mongo guy is trying to confuse me. Any other questions? Um, right. So, what are the other problems that problem domains that Cassandra are good for? And people keep coming up with some really good ones or whatever. And so, the Lucene index on top of you know with the Cassandra uh, backend is is a really good one. There's a lot of people that have been like jumping on that one. So, I've been picking up a lot of uh, users. And uh, the time series data one's like a no-brainer. I mean, it's just great at that. And uh, Cloud Kick and others are, that's like their bread and butter. Um, I mean, anything that doesn't, that uh, like you have, you know, just like the hyper table talk from earlier, there's no joins and there's no transactions. And so, I mean, provided that you can adapt your, you know, you can properly denormalize your application and live within those constraints, you know, you can't do the joins or whatever, it's pretty much good for whatever you want it to be, whatever you want to use it for. Um, I would, you know, we used to be pretty strong about telling people, you know, look, if 
if you don't have the need for the really high scalability, you know, the really high throughput and the really, really large data set sizes, just use a relational database. But there's been more and more people that have been using it for the distributed properties to take advantage of spanning data centers and rack locations. And I don't know, I'm kind of like, that's a pretty good application too. I mean, that, that, that's a byproduct of, of you know, distributing for, for scalability, but it's, it's a pretty good one. A lot of people seem to be really happy with using it for that, so that's another. Yes? So why shouldn't you use it for a small workload and a small number of machines? I mean, if you want to use it, that's fine by me. That's uh, you know, the more the merrier. But uh, I mean, I, you know, if if you're doing this professionally, you know, you're doing it for your employer, you know, then I would say like in good faith that you know doing it with like with relational database, which you know in this case you know is a, is a is a perfectly good fit, is going to probably mean you get called less often, and that you know that your employer will be able to hire other people to come along and uh, you know that already have the training and expertise and. I mean that's 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 what the practical side of me would say. But you know the geek would say, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Any others? Way back there? So the question was, you know for all those copies that you're not blocking on, that the replication is occurring in the background asynchronously, at what point does that, does that overcome the network? I, I mean, I would, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that. It's, it's one to one for however much you're copying. So I mean, if you had this enormous replica count you know, and, you're just, and you're just streaming a massive amount of data you know, on a relatively small cluster, you, you see what I'm saying? Like if you had a, you know, if you had a 10 node cluster and, uh, you know, 100 meg interconnect, and you're, you know, you're piping 120 megs worth of data into, the, you know, I mean, that's going to swamp it. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just the math there, actually. So, I mean, it's one-to-one -one transfer of every, everything you're writing is going to go out to those other, other replicas, and so however many nodes you're sending them to across whatever link. Any others? Okay, so the question is, how many inserts per second do you typically see? So that so depends on like the low, like what it is you're inserting and the hardware and you know and all that. But I mean, it's it's uh, you know upwards of hundred thousand on on pretty reasonable hardware and kind of hardware hundred thousand per second uh, per node per node on a per node basis. Um, how many F-Syncs? How many what? How many F-Syncs is that? Many F -syncs is that? Uh, very few. I mean, well, the data data written. Anyone who sat through the hypertable uh, talk, it's exact same there. You know, you have you have a commit log, and every write is written to the commit log, and then it's written into memory. And then you know, uh, when a threshold's hit on the in-memory structure, it's flushed all at once, so that you know you get all the sequential I/O. You know, the, all of the writes going into the commit log, that's sequential I/O. You just you're just appending a new entry. And when you flush the mem table, that's another sequential I/O. So they're, you know, disks are amazingly fast when you're not using them to seek around. Um, and so, but the, you know, the commit log gets flushed periodically. Otherwise, you know, there, there you know, we wouldn't be any durability. That's actually configurable. You can configure a window. You can dial down the amount, number of f-syncs. But we typically tell people to put the commit log on another disk, on another spindle anyway, and that ends up being good enough. But yeah, um, so I mean, it depends on the size of the hardware, how many cores, how much memory, how well you've tuned it, and all the rest of that. But I mean, um, just like, you know, uh, you know, relatively modern Opterons, you know, eight core, 32 gigs of memory. I mean, I would expect that that should be due like you know high tens of thousands without any problem. On you know unless you're using really large but values or something like that. Hey. <coughs> 